Okay, so I think we can get started today. Um, sorry about my mic. I think it's definitely worse because I don't have my normal headphones. But yeah. So welcome to your third week of introduction to Java. And let's just get started with an icebreaker. Is anyone doing anything fun this weekend? Has anyone done anything fun yet or is going to? Oh yeah, wait, that's right. Easter is this weekend. It's Easter weekend. <laughs> Forgot about that. So yeah, it sounds like everyone's gonna have fun, hopefully. Yes, I think your name is Rina because that's the link. I think it's actually related to the link you joined with. So okay. Well, with that out of the way, we can get started. So this week our topics are going to be on logic, if statements, and expressions. We've covered a bit of expressions in the past, but this is most of this is going to be brand new. But before do and before before we do any of that, um, we should go into a review of what we did last week. So, can anyone tell me what the decimal representation of this uh, binary string is? If they remember how to do that. Yeah, it's 23. Uh, good job, that was fast. <laughs> so if you don't remember how to do it, it's um, the way binary strings work is the first digit here, this, this one is one, second one is two, four, eight, 16. It goes up by powers of two, and then you multiply one with that power of two or zero with that power of two, and then you'll just add it all at the end, so. So yeah, that's a nice little practice for you. And then I think we have another one. This one's um, exploring a bit of an interesting topic that relates to binary strings. So um, you don't actually have to find what 64 is. I mean, not 64. Um, well, yeah, it is 64. You don't actually have to think about what that is. If you know that 128 is this number in base two, then you can easily find what that divided by two is. So does anyone know what that is? I like what Alan said about one minus um, 10,000, or I guess in binary, that would be uh, 16, but it's actually, I think Brian is correct. Here you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros. And then if you see here, yep, the correct answer has six zeros. And we know that because 128, the first place is one, second is two, four, 8, 16, 32, 64, and then 128. So if we just divide it by two, then we just shift it down to the right one. Yes. So we have 128 being the eighth place, um, and then 64 would be the seventh. So yeah, that's correct. And then does anyone know what the two possible values of a Boolean are? Yep, it's true and false, T and F. Um, you should be careful with capital T actually, because in Java, it's only lowercase true and lowercase false. And then also when calling a function, is this the correct way to do so? 
This is a true or false question, actually. Yep, it's either true or false. It, true or false. So just think about the way you called functions last week. Oh, wait, yeah, two weeks ago, my bad. <laughs> also, the class schedule will be more consistent starting from next session because there's been a lot of um, competitions and scheduling conflicts these weekends. So I, I've only been able to do every other weekend. So sorry about that, but. Um, your guess the first time is correct. It's true because, um, yeah. So next week we won't be having class either. I sent out, I'll send out another email about it during the follow-up to this week, but because of scheduling conflicts, we've had to do every other week. And starting from next week though, it'll be every single weekend. Um, you will have class the week after set, uh, session four. I'll send out an email that like clarifies all of that. So don't worry about it now. And then, yes, so this one would be true. You have function name and then you have the parameter inside. I think you have a good point with the class. Oh, wait, no, you meant class next week. But <laughs> if you wanted to call it from a particular class, you would have to put the name of the class dot the function name. But if you're just calling the function, this is the correct way to do so. You have your function name to tell the computer what function you want to execute. And then you pass in whatever parameters uh, there needs to be. That sometimes that might be like an integer or a string. Sometimes that might not be anything at all, so. But yeah, I think we can get started with our actual content for today. We have logical operators and logical operators there are these cool things that lets us make decisions with the computer. It also lets us consider multiple constraints. So what does that mean? It's basically like you look outside, you look at the weather and you say, oh, is it snowing? If it's snowing, I'll bring boots. And if it's snowing, but it's also cold, well, it usually is, but if it's snowing and cold, then I'll bring boots and a jacket. So logical operators, they basically let the computer make decisions based on multiple variables and booleans and constraints. Um, with one specific logical operator, it may also have a short circuiting effect and I'll explain it more in detail later on, but that's with the AND operator. Basically, unless you specify it for the computer not to do so, the AND operator looks at the first boolean and then it doesn't go on if the first one is false. Additionally, we have logical operators for the use of Booleans, they give us a Boolean back. So they give us a true or false back. And we also can give logical operators a true or false. And I'll show you what that means in a sec. Logical operators are also evaluated, evaluated left to right and with the use of parentheses. So I'll show you all of that in a second. But yeah, that's basically what log logical operators are. And here are the three logical operators in Java plus one comparison operator. I think it's called relational operator actually. But yeah, so these are the three logical operators. You have your and, or, and your not. So the and is true if both sides of it are true. And the or is true if one or both are true. And then the not basically just flips it. So you have, if you start out with a true, it gets turned into a false. And then if you have a false, it gets turned into a true. So that's what the not does. And then the last one here, um, it's equals equals. In Java, when you want to say, if you want to check if a number is equal to another number or if uh, one string is equal to another string, you might be tempted to use one single equal sign, but that's not correct. And you have to use two equals because that's what comparison is. It equals equals checks whether this thing is the exact same as this other thing. And actually, I think I mentioned strings, but okay, I'll talk about it in a sec. But here are some examples. So if you have true and true, you get a true out of it. If you have a true and false, and then another true, so it goes true, 
and false. So this one in total would be false. You would look at it first because there's a parenthesis around it. This would be false. And then you do false and and true, which is also false because you need both sides of this to be true, which it isn't, so it's false. And then you need both sides of this to be true, which it also isn't, it's, and the total is false. And or is different from the and operator, or is the double, what do you call these? It's the, um, you know, I have no clue. But basically you can get this symbol if you do the backslash. So uh, underneath your delete key, you see the, I think it's called forward slash actually, but backslash, forward slash, whichever one, that, whichever one that's called. And then you do shift, you click that and it gives you this symbol. And this is just the or operator. So how this works is you have a true and a false. And if one side of it is true, then it gives you a true. And then you have a true and a true. This obviously will give you a true because you have at least one true. And then you have the exclamation mark true, which just flips it and it turns into a false. And then the last one is the comparison, the equals equals. So you say is five equal to six? Is it the same number? No, it is not. It's not the same value. So it gives you a false. And you'll notice that with these um, logical operators, they, the expression gives you a Boolean back. So you see that out of all of these, every single one is either a true or a false. It's, the result is always a Boolean. So yeah. And also, I think I was talking about strings earlier, but the thing with strings is that it would actually not be equals equals. It would just be it's dot equals with strings because the way equals equals works is that it goes into the computer and it says, oh, is the memory the same from this to this? And it's actually, it does it in like a low level way. So basically, and basically because of the way strings work, um, the way they're stored, equals equals wouldn't work. So you have to use dot equals. And these four are the four relational operators that you see in Java. So you have greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, and less than or equal to. You'll see these in math too. So I'm sure that um, at least some of you are already familiar with these. And these ones also give you a Boolean back. So the greater than, if you say, oh, is seven greater than a five, you would say true, seven is bigger than five. And then this one, if it's, is seven greater than or equal to seven, you would also get a true because there's the equals at the end. And you have to be careful with these two, the greater than or equal to and the less than or equal to, because um, you have to put the equal sign after the um, greater than or less than. So also, yeah, I see some of you in the chat making faces with that symbol. Yes, you can make faces with it. You can make faces with a lot of characters, but yeah. Here are some exercises. So can someone tell me if the first one is going to give us a true or a false? Yep, that's correct. The first one is a true. If you look at the, you have to look inside the parentheses first. So if you look at the left side, you have a true and then or false. So because it's an or, some, or logical operator, it will give you a true back. And then this other side is false and and false. Obviously, this will give you a false because you have an and, which means that both sides of it need to be true and both sides are false. So you get false from here, but you get true from here. And the one that combines these two sides is an or operator. This means that um, just one or the other side need to be true and you have the left side being true. So the first one is true. So try not to guess on these. These are, you just have to work your way through methodically and logically. And then for the second one, does anyone know if it's true or false?
Yeah, I think Albert realizes why it's true. This is because uh, 384 divided by 2 is 192. And this problem also um, introduces a concept, which is that when you have a logic, when you have the comparison, you want to evaluate both sides of the comparison first before it gives you a Boolean. So you would, you would do the division first, 384 divided by 2 equals to 192, and then 192 equals to 192. So that would give you a true. And then because it's an OR operator, it's true or false. So you would get a true from it. Does anyone know what the third one would be? Yep, so this one's a bit tricky, but you just have to realize that you have to um, finish the expression that's inside of the parentheses first. So that means you look inside the parentheses and you see true and and, and then there's another parentheses. So you look inside of that one and you see that you have one side, you have true, and the other side you have a comparison, which is supposed to give you a Boolean. So you look at the comparison and is five greater than six? No, it isn't. So this is equal to, this side is equal to false. And then, but it's an or operator. So true or false, and you get a true from that. So it's true and true, which gives us a true at the very end. But you see that when we go back to the beginning, there's an exclamation mark, which is the not operator. It flips the Boolean. So true becomes false. So yeah, the answer to this one becomes false. And you won't see too many of these complex operators within code itself, but this is just a good exercise to test your understanding of it. But speaking of actually coding with these operators, does anyone have any idea of how we could use these expressions and these operators within actual Java code? Like, where would this be applied? Yes, I see some great points. You would use them in if statements, if else, and you could also use it to compare two inputs. And inputs we'll be covering next week, I think, because I think it's pretty cool when you can interact with your code and have it do different things based on what you put into it. But yeah, you can use these logical operators inside of if statements and if else, it's great that you already know what an else is, but also, yes, a for loop as well. And we'll be going into that next week as well. Okay, so you guys mentioned if statements and Booleans. And one uh, another thing that sometimes you might want to do is that you wouldn't want to directly use it inside of an if statement immediately. But you want to evaluate it and then you want to store it inside of a variable sometimes. So you could assign variables with it. If you look here, we have one variable called int age equals to 16, int birth year equals to 2002. And then we have a Boolean at the very end that tells us if the birth year is correct. So if um, someone was 16 right now, would it be possible that their birth year was in 2002? So could anyone tell me what the value of this Boolean was? Yes, it's false. Because if you see here, the way to find what your birth year was if you are 16 right now is you just do um, 2022 minus 16. I guess you could also be born in 2005. Actually, no, you couldn't. Not anymore. You could be born in 2006 and be 17 right now, I think. Something like that. I have no clue. But basically, 2022 minus 16 to find your birth year. And we know that gives us 2006. 
So if you are 16 currently, you would probably be born in 2006. And um, so, oh no, I guess you could be born in 2005 if it was later on, but okay. So, and we see that both years, 2002. And then we have the comparison, which is to say, is this equal to this? 2002 is obviously not the same as 2006. So Boolean both year correct would be false. So yeah, and it's great that some of you mentioned if statements because that's another super common usage um, where we see these logical operators being used. It's inside the if statements. So what is an if statement? Well, an if statement looks like this. If 16 equals to age, you print out he is 16 years old. Um, the way this, the reason we want this if statement is because you wouldn't want to print out he is 16 years old if age was 17. And to find whether or not it's equal to 16 is you use your equals equals. So let's break these if statements down. So if statements, they decide whether or not the code inside of the if statement will be executed. And be sure along with any other uh, loops, if statements, functions, make sure that your syntax for this is correct. Note that the if is not capitalized. The spacing can be off. For example, you could have some extra spaces in here or between, but just make sure that the syntax overall is correct. You have your if, you have your parentheses around the conditional, and then you have your curly brackets around the code that will be executed if the conditional is correct. And you have to note that the code inside will only be executed if the conditional is true. So this is when we see the use of logical operators. Uh, Albert put in the chat a for that's yeah that's a for loop, and we'll be doing that later on. But yeah, you can see that in there. There's also another conditional. It's a bit more complicated. Okay, so here's an exercise. This one's a bit complicated. It's a bit complex actually. So I'll give you a good bit of time. So create a function with an if statement inside of the inside of the function, so that the function will take in an integer as a parameter. And then the function, the function should be public static void so that you can call it from your main function. It should also be void because it's not returning anything. And then the if statement will print out a message if the number that you give the function is less than 10. After you create this function, you should call it several times from main. And you should call it, you should call it with a range of numbers, say from 1 to 20 you choose some of those numbers and then you call it and you see which ones print out depending on the if statement. So I'll leave this up. I'll give about 10, 15 minutes for you, to, for you to do this. And then at the end, if you feel confident, you can show me what you've done.
it. So I think some people are done. Um, I'll give three more minutes and I'll explain how to do this. And also I see some people discussing it in the chat. So I'll clarify that as well. So, you know what, I'll just talk about it. First, I'll screen share what I did for this poem. Okay, so basically, I did something like this. Okay, so we have our class called if statement, you could call your class whatever you want. And then we have our public static void main. So this is where the code actually executes. And this is where my function called less than 10 is called. And we can see that the definition here, it's right here. And less than 10, the name of the function is less than 10. And it has a one single parameter, which is int value. And there's an if statement. If the value is less than 10, system.out.print line value is less than 10. I think um, someone in the I think I'll build something very similar to this. So if you want to run the code, I've already done it once, but you'll see that only these two print out, three and six. Also value colon, this is just an overlay that the editor gives me. So it's three and six that give us three is less than 10 and six is less than 10. Oh, I guess I forgot a space. So yeah. And then, so I think in the chat, people were talking about how 10 is actually greater than 10 because it's base to 10. Also, yes, I can copy and paste that in my code in the chat here. Um, I'll send it. Uh, there we go. That's just my code. And then, so people were talking about how 10 is actually greater than uh, base two of 10 because it's a base two, but yes, you do have to specify that one zero is a base two string. You In Java, when you put a number down, these, and I, will, and I was actually gonna talk about what these are called later on, but these numbers are called literals and these um, unless you specify that they are base two, Java assumes that they are integers. So 10 is not greater than 10 simply because Java assumes that it's just 10 and 10. So 10 is equal to 10. And here, I'll clarify this again in a sec.
Okay, so before we talk about anything else, I want to introduce else and else ifs. So else and else ifs are super important tools that you can use alongside if statements inside of Java. I saw that Albert already implemented this in his exercise, but basically else and else if, um, they execute only if the original if statements condition is false. So these things, else's and else ifs, that's why they are called else. So if this condition, condition one is true, then this code executes. Else, this statement then executes instead. So if condition and then else. Notice that the syntax means you have to put the else on top of the second curly bracket. If you don't put it on top of the second curly bracket, the else statement doesn't know which if statement it goes with and it will give us give you a syntax error. And then else if is the exact same as else, except it evaluates one more condition. So it says, if condition one is true, it executes this code, this statement to be executed. And if it's false, it goes to the else if. So if condition one is true, else, if condition two is true, this code then executes. So you'll see that else if only executes if condition one is false and then condition two is true. So um, some people might be confused. Why can't you just do this with operators? And it's they are two completely they are two completely different things because the condition one being true executes a different thing from condition two two being true. So it's not just a true or false. You might want to say, oh, if it's not raining outside, I want to bring a rain jacket. But if it's super sunny, I might bring sunglasses. So it's not a straight up true or false. You want to incorporate an else if as well. Okay, so here's the second part of the exercise. Basically just add an else if to your previous function that prints out a number if the number is, um, that prints out a message if the number is less than 10, but also greater than five. So say six, you could say six is less than 10, but greater than five. So you would need an else at the end that, oh, well, I guess it's two separate things. You would have an else if here and then an else at the very end that also prints out a message. Maybe it says um, this number is less than five. And then you will also want to know that the else will only execute if the previous if statement is false along with the else if statement. Also note that there may only be one else statement inside the entire block of code. You cannot have more than one else statement attached to it, one if statement because the if statement only has one else, right? You can't have it say, oh, um, this if statement is false, but I want to do multiple things. There can only be one else statement. Of course, it's one block of code, so you can, a lot, you can have a lot of stuff inside of it, but only one else. And it can only be at the very end. So after all your ifs and else ifs. So I'll give you guys another 10 minutes to do that. Um, actually, probably a bit shorter, but you guys have time to go and practice with ifs and else ifs.
Uh, I'll give about four more minutes, three.
Okay, so it sounds like some of you are done. And it looks, okay, so I guess I'll just share what I do with this one. And it looks like some of you did do it correctly with the use of else and if. Okay, so basically we have, we have a value and if it's less than 10, you print out if it's less than 10. And then I'll, set, I'll just basically just set up the if statements and the else if and else. And then if the value is greater than five, you print out something and then else you just print, oh, it's less than all of these. So the reason that this works is because the first one goes and sees, oh, if the value is less than 10, you print out value is less than 10. And then um, else if value is greater than five, you print out value is between five and 10. And you know, it has to be between five and 10 because, um, oh, well, I guess you can just print if it's greater than five because you could have the value be greater than 10 and then it wouldn't go to here. So I guess a more appropriate number instead of five would be greater than 10 as Albert did or 15 or some other number. And then else, so for example, if you had value less than 10 and value greater than five, then else would be, oh, value is between 10 and five. So 15 is a better number for this example than five, simply because you might have a number that's greater than 10, but that's also greater than five because it's greater than 10. Okay, and then, so that's it for if statements and else and else if. And don't forget with coding, if any of this seems confusing or you can't do it on the first try, that's perfectly normal. <laughs> Nobody can implement these things perfectly on the first try. And I'll copy and paste my setup for the if statements and, elf, and else and else if into the chat. So here is what I did for that. Okay, and then just don't forget to not give up and practice with these things because these things take time to really get down and have yourself be able to do fluently and fluidly. So just practice with these and I'll send out the homework too. So it's important that you do that. And this week, I'll make sure that the homework is extremely comprehensive of everything we've done so far. So as long as you can finish that, I believe you'll have a basic grasp of how these things work. Okay, so we'll be moving on to expressions now. And we've seen some expressions previously with say five plus six divided by 11, 24. Um, this is a modulus and I'll talk about that in a second. And expressions involve variables, operators, and literals. What does this mean? It means that you have variables inside of your expressions, say age plus one or age plus two, if you aged two years. And then you have your operator, which is in the case of age plus two, it would be the addition sign. And you also have your literals. Literals are just these things, each your five, six, and 11. Java calls it literals because they are um, values that you can just type out. They are just there. It's not a variable. It's not an operator. They're not stored anywhere. It's for you to um, do expressions with basically. And expressions should always be giving you something. So in the case of this first one, it's giving you an integer. In the case of the second one, we see the logical operators and we know that after evaluating all of this, it will give us a Boolean. So can anyone actually tell me what the first one will output, what the output for the first one is? Um, the, first ex the first expression here, five plus six divided by 11. So then, does anyone have any idea of what that would give us? Yes, that's math. It would be giving you an, we're getting an integer out of it. So it's not true or false. It's just a value.
Um, I see that there's some confusion with what the order of operations is here. So no, the answer actually wouldn't be one. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. So the answer is actually five. And that's because I think, yeah, I think someone's putting in the chat, it's five and it's also six divided by 11. And don't forget when you're doing um, expressions with computers, it might be somewhat confusing, but it actually does follow PEMDAS. So you would be doing the division first. So it's six divided by 11, which yes, computer math, that is less than one. So because of the way ints work in Java, and we'll talk about more, and we'll talk more about it, it actually becomes zero. So it's five plus zero. And then the output for this is five, not um, six over 11 or one, as some of you might think. Okay, does anyone know what the second one is? This is a also a bit confusing, and I wanted to include this because it introduces the concept of these modulus operators. Yes, the floor function, that's what it's called. Okay, yeah. And I think some of you are realizing that there are some gaps in knowledge here and that's intended because it's modulus and modulus in programming is just the remainder function. So basically, if you have three modulus two, you, the answer would be one because modulus is division and then it gives you the remainder of that division. So here it's 22, I mean, it's 24 modulus 22 and that simply gives you two because um, the remainder when you divide 24 by 22 is two and two is equals to two. So the left side here is true and the right side here is true. And also you don't have to take algebra two or take any sort of advanced math or algebra to understand this. You simply don't know what modulus is because I'm about to introduce it. And I just wanted to see if anyone already knew what it was. That's not any advanced um, algebra concept at all, so. And one, of the, one important thing with expressions is that expressions will, always, will always give you something. Expressions, um, they always, it's like a function that has a return type. They always return to you some value. For the first one, it's an int. Second one, it's a Boolean. Okay, so here we introduce the five arithmetic operators that we have in Java. We have the addition sign, we have subtraction, we have division, multiplication, and modulus. And if you're confused on what modulus is, modulus quite simply is just division, but instead of giving you what the answer to the division is, it gives you how many numbers are left after you divide out of it as much as possible. So that means if you have seven, uh, modulus three, we know that the least number that's completely divisible by three that's less than seven is six. So six divided by three equals to two, but we're not looking for six. We're looking for one because that's what seven minus six is. It's how much is left after you try to do the division by that number for as much as possible. So it's the remainder. That's all it is to it. And it's fine if you don't uh, completely understand what modulus is at this point, you won't be using it too much. In fact, um, the most I have used it for, the most you use it for on basic concepts is to decide whether it's an even or odd number. Yeah, so modulus is just the remainder. That's all it is. It, that's all it's giving you and it's not too complicated. And please don't mistake it for the percent symbol because the percent symbol, it doesn't really exist in Java the same way it would in math. So the percent sign is just modulus of Java. You can also do some cool operators on variables that aren't specifically um, operators. So you don't have to write out the entire equation. You can just have h plus equals to five. This means that you're incrementing it. I believe that's what they call it. You're incrementing the variable. So h plus plus, be careful here. It's not just one plus, it's plus plus to tell, to tell Java and the computer that you're incrementing by one. So age plus plus is you aging by one. 
and then age minus minus is going down by one. And this might seem kind of redundant. You might be like, oh, when am I ever going to be adding by just one? There's actually a lot of times in Java where you're just going up by one sometimes. And we'll see more of that in, later on. But yeah, so plus plus is incrementing by one. Minus minus is down by one. Age plus plus equals to five. This simply means that you add five to your age and then you set age equal to it. So for example, if you had your age as 16 earlier, if you do plus equals to five, then you would have 16 plus five, and then you set it equal to whatever that result is. So 16 plus five, if you age by five years, you get 21 out of it. So age is now set equal to 21. So that's really convenient. You don't have to write out the entire thing. You don't have to be like age equals to age plus five. It's just age plus equals to five. And then the second one that you see here is pretty self-explanatory. It's the same exact thing, but it's minus. So age minus equals to five. So if you're 16 and you somehow took a time machine and you aged back five years, then it would be minus equals to five, which 16 minus five equals to 11, and then it gets set to 11. So that's how it works. And yeah, are there any questions? I think there's a lot of discussion. Oh, I think someone made a joke. Okay, so yes, exactly. So you might use the increments and the minus equals and plus equals in Python because Python has the same exact syntax um, with these increments. Okay, so precedence. Does anyone know how computers do math? I think I mentioned this, I spoiled this earlier in the session, but does anyone know the order of operations, if that sounds familiar, in which computers do math? Yep, there's math in the background because computers doing math and humans doing math is basically the same thing. Yes, PENDAS. Everyone's, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about it, especially if you grew up in the United States education system. Um, if you don't know what PEMDAS is, don't worry at all. I will explain it right now. It's just an abbreviation for the order in which you do math. So first is parentheses, that's your P, and then your exponent, and then your multiplication, division, and modulus, they happen at the same time, left to right, and then your addition and subtraction, also left to right. So if you have multiple, multiple parentheses, multiple uh, multiplication, division, modulus, multiple addition, subtraction, you just do it left to right. And then you have your exponents, which is kind of weird in Java when you're coding, coding because you actually won't see exponents that much. Unlike in say Python, I don't believe there's a specific operator or symbol in Java for exponent. It's not the caret, if you know what I, if you know what I'm talking about, it's not like the pointing up triangle. That doesn't, that isn't um, expo the exponent. You have to use the math class for it unless you want to do a loop. And that's pretty complicated. So just don't worry too much about exponent for now. Mainly just keep it in your mind that you see the parentheses, you do what's inside of the parentheses first, and then you apply PEMDAS also in, inside of the parentheses. It's just like how you would do math in real life. So when you look at an equation in Java or in code, don't be scared. Don't think it's, oh, it's like a calculator. It doesn't know what order I want it to do because some calculators will do it in the wrong order, right? In Java, um, just be certain that it's using the same exact laws for the order of operations, just like you would in math. So let's have some examples, some practice problems for this. Does anyone know? Okay, first question is pretty easy. Five plus six, it's 11. And then the second one, 25 divided by five, that's equal to five. Does anyone, does anyone want to um, type out the answer for the third one?
Yeah, it's 273. I mean, 473. <laughs> and I probably should have made the number a bit smaller, but I thought it would be fine because it's only multiplying by two. Yes, of course you can use a calculator. That's what computers are for. Uh, a lot of computers, a lot of the time, um, if you do say, I don't know, competitive math or just hard math problems, sometimes you realize that you can just do it with an algorithm. If you can just code it out, it becomes 10 times easier. So yes, of course you can use a calculator. This isn't a math class, it's a coding class. And then the fourth one, just like we've talked about, the percent means modulus. So it means the remainder. So 19 modulus eight and then divided by three. So 19 modulus eight gives us three. And then three divided by three is one. Yep, it's one. Uh, please try not to spam the chat too much. Just once is enough so that I can see everyone else's answers. But yeah, it's one. And then, so can anyone tell me what the fourth one, I mean, the fifth one is? Is it also one? Oh, I guess it's also one. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> so if you look at this, let's apply PEMDAS. We see a parentheses, so we have to do what's inside of it first. So inside of it, we have 32 modulus four, which is zero because 32 can be clean, clean, cleanly divided by four. So it gives us eight. And then we know that because 32 is a multiple of four, it's eight times four equals to 32. We just have zero as the result. So zero times three is zero, obviously. And then we add one to it, which is also one. So can anyone tell me what the last one is? Yes, it is indeed 11. So as you can see, it's 11 divided by what's inside of the parentheses, 67 minus 33 times two. But you have to be careful with this. It's not 34 times two. As if you want to do 67 minus 33 first, that would give you 34. And then if you multiply, if you multiply that by two, you'll get the wrong solution. But it's actually 33 times two, and it's 67 minus that, which is 67 minus 66, which is one. So one divided by one, I mean, 11 divided by one is just 11 again. So yeah, the last one solution is 11. Okay, before we go on, I was planning to save loops for a later session, but I realized that we actually have a lot of time left today because I took out one of the earlier exercises. So does anyone have any questions so far? Anything they want me to go back and look at? I know there might still be some more confusion with the um, percent sign. Is there anything specific that anyone is confused on? Any specific topic? Um, if you're just confused in general, I would say that coding, a lot of it, it's all very logical. So everything is consistent as long as you um, understand the concepts. And if you know the specific syntax, that, and then it should make sense. Okay, so if you're confused about parameters, I think I can quickly go over it. And then if there's no other questions, we can move on. So parameters, I think, I don't think I can pull up the slides fast, but parameters, um, actually I'll go do that right now. Give me a second.
Okay, so we'll do a quick few minutes of review on parameters because they are a bit difficult. A lot of people who do code will be confused on how exactly parameters work. Um, this is the wrong one. Give me a second. Okay, here it is. So with variables, if you want to use variables inside of your functions, as we did earlier with our age, I mean, our value variable, and we wanted to see if it was less than or greater than 10. If you want to use variables, you have to declare them either within the method itself, because otherwise the method won't know what variable you're talking about, or you can pass variables into the method, and that's called a parameter. So this code, it would actually give you a um, it would give you an error because the my method doesn't know what parameter is. So parameter you declare here as 20, and then you say my method, you want to print it out, you want to print out parameter, but it doesn't know what that is because you didn't declare it within the same method. So how you would actually print it out is by passing the parameter into the method. So the syntax for it, there's two parts to it. You have to, ha you have, to have it when you create the method. So when you say my method, you would have to say, look, we can pass in an int value here. So it says int value, that's one of your parameters. It's set up so you can pass one in. And then when you actually call it, you have to pass in the parameter. If you don't pass it in, it will also give you an issue because the method is only created so that you can pass in a parameter. So my method, and then you pass in your variable called 20, and then it prints it out for you. So it says, my method, you pass in the parameter, which is 20. And then down here, it says my method in value, and it gets the value, which you passed in as 20, and it prints it out. So that's how parameters work. And I would strongly suggest going back and looking at the previous classes, recordings, or slides if you are confused. Okay, so if we're done with that, we shall go to the other thing while loops. Okay, so I saw that someone already um, implemented a for loop into their exercise code, but what I think is actually more directly related to conditions, conditionals and uh, operators are while loops. And yes, I would say that while loops are actually um, slightly easier to set up than a traditional for loop, but you do have to be careful because while loops can be very dangerous, especially in, say, Python. <laughs> okay, so what are while loops? First of all, I should introduce what loops are in general. And this is going to be a very short introduction to loops. We'll be going much more in depth next week at the next session. But loops, they basically allow you to uh, do something repeatedly multiple times. So say you wanted to print something out a hundred times. You wouldn't use, you wouldn't copy and paste your print statement a hundred times. That's extremely redundant. And you know, you just wouldn't want to do that. So what you could do instead is you could write a loop that goes a hundred times and runs a hundred times. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do that with a full loop in the next exercise, I mean, in the next session. But today we'll be looking at while loops. And while loops, it's like an if, it's an if statement, but instead of an if at the beginning, it says while. And this completely changes what it does. So while conditional, while condition, you execute the statement, you execute the code inside of it. So what this actually does is at the very beginning, when it gets this while loop, it checks, is this condition true? Um, is this number less than 10? If it's true, then you execute your statement. However, you have to be extremely careful with while loops. Um, I think some, some of you did Python in the past and you'll know that in Python, at least for some editors, if you don't end your while loop, it just goes, the memory it handles just goes on and on and it crashes your computer in a way. So you have to be extremely careful with while loops because they can go on for straight up infinity if you never end the loop. And it's extremely easy to end up having your while loops going into infinity if you just forget to end it. And the way you end it is by, you change what the condition depends on. So th what does this mean? So here's an example of a while loop that I wrote earlier, earlier, and 
this just says um, while the value is less than 10, it executes the statement and then it increments the value. See here, for example, you would want the um, plus plus to be used. It's just extremely short. It's simple. It's it's good to look at. Everyone knows when they see plus plus, you just add it. You're just incrementing it by one. And the reason that this works is because while the value is less than ten, you would you would do the statement inside of it. But then, because this finishes running, it's just gonna go. It's just going to start again, and it's just going going to run over and over if you never change the condition that the while loop depends on. So. Because it depends on the variable value, you would want to change the value of this variable. Okay, it's kind of a bad name having it named as value, but you just increment it by one, you make it bigger by one, and then because eventually it will become greater than 10 or equal to 10, it's going to stop. So say, for example, I put in the value two. Does anyone know, could someone put in the chat how many times this while loop would execute this statement if the value at the beginning of it was two? So to answer the earlier question in the chat, Yes, Java does have a break function, but I'm pretty sure that um, good practice with coding is that you don't have a break function. So try not to ever have break functions in your code. If you organize your code properly and your code properly, there shouldn't be there shouldn't ever be a need for one, unless you want to just test out your while uh, while loop one time. Okay, so. I see some people putting eight, some I see a seven. Um, I said the value at the beginning would be two. So it would be two and it runs once. So two, it goes up to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. But then 10 doesn't run. So 10 doesn't count. Um, Huh, is it seven? Did I count wrong? It, so the value starts at two. The statement goes once while it's at two because the value isn't incremented at the end until the end. So it starts at two, it goes once, it goes to three, it goes twice. So it starts at two, it goes once, it goes to three, it goes twice, it goes to four a third time, and then it goes five, six, seven, eight, nine and nine is still less than 10. So it goes into the statement one more time as nine. That's the eighth time this is going to be run. And then it goes up to 10, but then 10 doesn't, um, 10 doesn't work. So it goes into it and it looks at it and says, oh, 10 is not less than 10. So the statement actually here is actually only being um, executed three times, I mean, eight times. So yeah, um, it breaks at 10, not after 10, because it's less than 10. Uh, I just realized that I spelled statement wrong here. That's tragic. But yeah, so this is how while loops work. And we have a few minutes left of class. So let's just do one final exercise. I wanted to change it based on how much you guys understood this. But basically, so add to the earlier function, except this time use a while loop to run, to print out value. Okay, so I think you guys basically got the gist of while loops, uh, at least some of you did. And hopefully you can do this exercise. So add to the earlier function of is less than 10. And then, except this time when you pass in the variable, you use a while loop to print out value is less than 10 until it's no longer true. 
So you make sure that you, add, so you make sure you increment at the very end. Okay, so if that makes sense, get started on that. And then hopefully before class ends today, um, some of you can send your code and show me. Also, this is extremely important. Don't forget to end your while loops. Don't just have your while loops go on and on. Earlier, we saw that unless you added one to it at the very end, it would just keep going. So make sure you add to your, you change the conditional that the while loop depends on. A few minutes left, but I'll give everyone else some time. Albert, if you want to work on something in the meantime, um, can you add an if statement into your while loop that prints out if it's less than 10 and also if it's an even number using the modulus operator? So basically you'll have an if statement inside of the while loop, which is just testing whether or not it's even, and then it changes the prints based on that. So. Also, if anyone else is done, just do the same thing. Print out if it's less than 10, but also if it's a, an odd or an even number.
Hey, that looks good, Albert. And also, I'll screen share what I did for this one, this exercise, and then I'll let all of you get some get some rest because it seems that some of you are tired. Okay, so if you want to look here, I'll put this. I'll put this in the chat right now, actually, so that we have time. But this is basically what I did. So you have a. So you have your main, which just calls um, your function less than 10, and then it passes in the value. And you say, while the value is less than 10, you print out value is less than 10, and then you add one to the value. So you go all the way up until 10, which then it stops. So yeah, that's basically how it works. And then that should give you the input down here. You see one is less than 10, four is less, Oh, I guess I started from three. So three is less than 10, four is less than 10, five is less than 10, six is uh, less, and then it goes up to nine and it stops. And you'll notice that it doesn't print out 10 is less than 10 because the while loop says this is false. The value 10 is not less than 10 here. So we won't print this out. Okay. So yeah, I think that's all, we, all I have for you today. Good job, everybody. And I'll be sending out a follow-up, which will include the clarification for next week's schedule. And after next week, it should be completely stable. So I'm sorry about the whole scheduling conflict stuff. But yeah, and also send out the homework, which should be comprehensive and cover everything. So goodbye, everybody. Good luck. I mean, not good luck. Good job. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody.